Okay, um, <clears throat> uh, let's just uh, talk about uh, uh, what occurred uh, last class this Wednesday. So um, we take a look at the uh, uh, dynamic performance of the ADC and then the way we uh, measure the dynamic performance of the ADC, which is the uh, spectrum of the, the ADC output. So um, <clears throat> uh, first of all, we uh, we discussed about. Let's change this. Okay. So we the the mathematical tools for um, the to measure the dynamic performance of ADC is just the DFT. So we uh, briefly talk about the DFT. So when whenever you have a, a limited number of samples from uh, ADC, okay? Um, okay, so I'm kind of confused. So um, this is about the discrete time. We have an, uh, we have an, at this point, we have an, um, uh, we haven't uh, did the quantization yet. So anyway, so for the discrete time samples, we, uh, we, we can have just a limited number of time samples from a, a zero to a n minus one. So when we have a time sample, so we can uh, throw this sample into the DFT. And then DFT will, uh, will generate, uh, again, N frequency beams, right? Which is the uh, evenness space between uh, zero to FS frequency. <clears throat> so in, the, in this next page, what we uh, discussed last time is that uh, then the, the point here is that uh, then how, ma how many samples you need to take, right? So uh, because we are throwing we are throwing n time samples into the DFT, and this will give you starting from a zero will give you um, n frequency beams n minus one, so they are even evenly spaced. So um, like this, right? So um, the distance between two adjacent uh, frequency beam, which we call the uh, resolution of DFT is FS over N, right? Because we are placing N frequency beams, right? <coughs> Evenly from uh, zero to FS. So this is the resolution of your um, <clears throat> DFT. So uh, in the in the class we uh, we discussed about this one we we discussed about one example like uh, if your F in is one hertz and F S is a ten hertz, right? And then you take the uh, ten point DFT. So in this case, the resolution should be. Uh, FS over 10, so it should be one hertz, right? So, so A0 corresponds to uh, the frequency component at one hertz frequency and, and so on, A2 is a two hertz frequency. So this is uh, just a simple mathematics, it's uh, basically what you really need to know to understand this. This concept is just uh, uh, plus and minus and uh, division or something like that. So really pretty basic. But uh, um, you, you, the point here is that uh, you need to do you need to do this process. What what I what I did right now by yourself. Okay, that way you can clearly understand uh, uh, what we discussed. Um, and this is important because. Uh, at the last of the class, we uh, keep talking about the DFT and spectrum and uh, SNR, SFDR, or something like that, right? So it's really uh, important to um, keep this uh, concept in mind. Okay, so anyway, so go back to this example. So um, <clears throat> the resolution is one hertz. Okay, so let's say you have a, a Five somewhere here, and then a six somewhere here. So this is a five hertz component, and this six hertz. So, but 
if you want to know the frequency component, let's say, for example, at 5.5 uh, hertz, right? So with this, uh, if it is resolution, uh, the energy or the, the frequency component at this frequency is somewhere, right? It's go to the other frequency beams, but not exactly, cannot be exactly presented at this specific frequency at uh, 5.5 hertz. So in this case, uh, you cannot really see how much energy, right, is placed at this frequency exactly. And then the way you need to take a look at is just uh, increase the resolution. So instead of uh, 10, now if you have a 20, right, meaning that uh, you need to wait more time to, to gather the sample, uh, the sample the signal, right? Your sampling frequency remains the same. Your input frequency remains the same. So only, only thing we increase is just uh, the number of samples. So you need to wait longer time. So double, double the uh, sampling time, right? So then finally you can see that the uh, frequency beams in between, right? So here now is the A11, right? This is A20. Okay, so this is uh, what uh, what uh, this sentence means. Okay, so uh, this is about the DFT. So next uh, next thing we discussed last time is that uh, then. Okay, we know the we understand the DFT resolution. Then uh, what we need to understand is the energy theorem. Okay, in pre either in frequency domain and in in um, time domain, the, the signal energy doesn't change, right? So if you have a continuous time signal, you have a, you can define the energy of this signal, and then you sample, and then you also calculate the energy from this sample, and then they, they are the same, right? That's, that's what uh, this energy theorem tells you. And then we modify this energy theorem into the RMS format. Why? Because uh, in, we, in, in mixed signal IC, we normally um, uh, define the quantity of like a signal into the RMS format. Uh, just people like like to uh, have the RMS format in, in those kind of quantities, so like a quantization noise, a sinusoid signal, RMS value, and uh, KT of C noise. We define that one picofarad KT of C noise is uh, 64 microvolt RMS, right? If we just we, we, if we keep the mean scale value, that's okay. But uh, normally people don't like to have uh, these complicated numbers by scaling 64 microvolt is uh, is kind of complicated, right? So anyway, so we take the RMS format of this one, then we finally get uh, this one. Normally, we already have a time sample, right? So uh, once we have a uh, a0, A n minus 1, this is the given. Okay, so, so we know this is just nothing but the numbers, right? Like, like a 1.123 or something, right? So we have all this, the sequence of the numbers. So this number goes to here. Then you can directly uh, calculate the RMS value of your time sample. So this is given. What we want to know is basically this one. Okay. So we, this is given. Uh, we already knew this. And also from the energy theorem, we know that this relationship, right, these are the same. And then from that point, we can calculate uh, the frequency magnitude of a specific frequency beam. So, so, for example, for the quantization noise, right? Last time we the quantization noise spectrum, we already know how they looks like in spectrum. They will be up to a zero to a a m minus one, right? They so this is a white noise, right? Meaning that uh, all frequency beam 
have, it, have the same magnitude. So they just think about this as this height is a, then this should be n times a square, right? So that way we can from and then we know that uh, we know that uh, we know that uh, how much is this value, right? So we already knew this. So that way we can calculate uh, this height, right? That's that's what we use this uh, equation. Okay. We, we, we anyway. So we um, we talk about this last time. So you can you can do by yourself uh, for like a white noise, like a quantization noise or the thermal noise. You can have a this equation. So that way you can simply calculate this one. This corresponds to a right in frequency spin they all have the same height and this is height well you can you can see the dc signal this signal will have only uh only the the value at a zero and last of all, the frequency spin should be zero so go back to this equation you can keep just one a zero and less of them, less of the frequency being is zero, so you can simply calculate like this. Also, the sinusoidal signal. So once you move to the sample the domain, we um, you already knew that if you sample the F in signal with the FS, then you will get a replica and FS over F in here, right? And then this is just keep repeating, right? So, anyway, so starting from zero to FS, that's the, what we are uh, interested in. So, um, zero to FS, we we, we know that we're gonna have a two frequency beam with the same height, right? So that way, um, um, that way, so this should be a m plus a n minus m, right? Okay, that's here. Right, only two left, right? Yeah, this one and this one. So that way we can, even before we take the DFT and you throw basically in the MATLAB, you throw the the number number uh, the time samples into the DFT function. But even before we take the DFT, we already knew that where they exist. Okay, in terms of the signal, the noise or distortion, we don't know. Okay, that's what we. Um, but basically, we are not taking the DFT for the signal. Signal we can simply calculate, right? Using this one, the 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 reason why we take the DFT is because we want to know the uh, harmonics and noise, right? Because if you just take a look at the time sample, right? Those value is just so small, then we cannot really see that how much is the distortion in this uh, signal time uh, sample the signal. So um, anyway, so but anyway, so by by calculating uh, the location of your input pre input um, input signal and also the height of this one, what what we can see is that after you take the DFT, you can see that your DFT uh, result is wrong or right, right? Because normally we use the MATLAB function, we don't just take a look at the, the detailed code inside the function. We just uh, use them, right? So if you are just using those kind of complicated functions without knowing anything about the function, that you you may um, may have a problem that um, you don't know really whether this your your code is right or not, and also your um, the function output is the right or not, right? So anyway, so this example, um, <clears throat> we have uh, f in is 300k, fs is 10 times faster, and with uh, n is equal 10,000. Okay, so um, first of all, uh, we basically, we, we can see where the the pre we can calculate the uh, frequency beams that uh, where your input signal will be located, right? So um, 
according to this one, um, let's just do this one more time. So uh, this is very important. So uh, you, you need to fully understand this one. So anyway, so FS uh, is uh, three megahertz, and then you're gonna place the ten thousand frequency bins even if play, even if place the uh, from DC to FS, which is the three megahertz. So the each frequency bin, right? The, the resolution, the, the difference between two adjacent frequency beams should be 3 uh, mega divided by 10,000, right? So this should be, um, okay, I think I just made mistake last, uh, in the last class. Uh, so anyway, so this uh, should be 0.3K, right? Mm. So which is the anyway so three hundred hertz. I guess, I, guess um, I made a mistake, but this is right. Uh, whatever I said in the class, that that was wrong. So um, this is a three hundred hertz. So each frequency starting from first one is a three hundred hertz, and second one is six hundred hertz or something like that. So your input is a three hundred k. So uh, it should be here, and this frequency bin number should be um, thousand, right? So thousand, uh, multiple, uh, 300 multiplied by thousand is a 300k. So we, we already knew that where your frequency bin located, and also using the RMS, uh, the energy theorem, right? We can cal also calculate the, the the magnitude of your frequency bin. So uh, the FT output will looks like this. We already talked about this. So again, as we uh, expected, uh, we get one tone at uh, one signal bin at a uh, thousand, and the other same, exactly the same at uh, uh, nine thousand. So everything here is. Uh, can have a mirror image around uh, in the middle at 5,000, right? So this side, this side is just folded. Okay, so um, <clears throat> regarding this K um, of this Y axis, so normally we use the um, DB, DB scale with the normalized DB scale. So uh, what, what this tells you is that uh, um, Anyway, so we are, um, you are talking about the ADC or any, any kind of the circuit to uh, the, normally if you have uh, some circuit block here, then um, because of many regions, right, the, the signal amplitude to that circuit block is normally limited, right? So for example, um, if you are AD, if, if this is the ADC, then we basically have a reference voltage starting from zero to let's say VREP for the for the thin grained version, but for the, the differential we have, might have a, a minus VREP and plus VREP or something like that. So this is the limitation of your input amplitude, right? If you apply the input signal beyond the, this range, right, then you just you're gonna get a huge distortion. So we normally uh, do not apply for uh, the input signal uh, beyond this uh, this limit. So then, the, what what is the it is AF, AFS means the full scale um, the full scale of your input signal. So what is the full scale? Is full scale is this limit, okay? So once you apply the signal exactly the same as the which which has amplitude exactly the same as this first scale we we call that a full scale input okay so but still you can apply the small signal amplitude smaller than the full scale but this full scale uh, corresponds to uh, this limit okay so this is not the signal okay this is the limit of your um, your circuit right. <coughs> which your circuit can uh, 
uh, uh, process uh, properly. Okay. But uh, in in actual application, normally we don't apply the full scale, right? Because any kind of smoke offset might, if you have a uh, let's say, uh, this is one board, then you can um, you can apply the the, the basically a sinusoidal signal like with amplitude one board, but even small offset inside the maybe comparator or OPM can shift up and down your signal, right? If if you you are really uh, apply the full scale input, then that because of that small uh, offset voltage will shift up your signal, and then your signal uh, go beyond this limit, even even though this is a very small, but uh, that will introduce huge distortion. So normally, in real application, we apply the input signal a little, a little bit smaller than uh, the full scale. Okay maybe minus 3 dB or something. This is the actual uh, full scale signal to your system. Okay, but anyway, so this is the DV full scale. So if we, are, if we put that this graph into uh, the DV, DV full scale, like this, then the, because in this case, I, it's just a simulation. So I just apply the really full scale input so in, in this case, uh, if this if we, if we, we think about we, we think this as a ADC, then the, um, probably uh, if this is the reference is plus one uh, plus one four four one four one four and minus reference is minus one four one four. So this is the two A two A, and then sinusoidal the signal I applied. Geez, the amplitude is 2 and 2 8, so this is the same. For this case, full scale input signal and this remit is the same. But anyway, so this is the signal. I mean, this is the simulation, so there is no kind of offset. Um, there is no um, offset kind of things. Okay. So anyway, so I put uh, this, this is 0 dB, and then last double signal go below uh, this uh, fundamental signal, and then last time I, uh, I also already uh, explained that this minus around the minus three dB is the basically uh, quantization noise of your your MATLAB. Okay, very uh, accurate. Okay, so then the, this is the before uh, the quantization. So in the MATLAB, by using the round function, we can um, just this one line of code can uh, give you the quantization uh, effect. So just uh, just uh, at this at uh, this FFT and uh, this quantization, you need to do uh, you need to do by yourself with the MATLAB. Okay, just to. Uh, um, just uh, just the study the text is not enough okay so anyway so um our adc here is that uh, again the reference is the uh 2.828 meaning that your full scale input is one volt rms sign okay <clears throat> and then i assume that the uh, resolution is the uh, number of bit is uh, 16 Okay, so our FS was a 3 megahertz, and then FIN was a 300K. The same, same as before. Uh, here, from the previous slide, only thing we want to do is just adding the quantization. So in the previous slide, if we just ignore the, this quantization uh, noise from your MATLAB, uh, which, which is way, way too small, uh, to take any kind of effect into your circuit simulation. So we just ignore this part, so meaning that this is all zero. So from uh, previous slide, we know that, uh, and, and then let's just talk about until FPS over two, okay? Beyond that, we don't need to know. 
uh, exactly the same uh, thing happens uh, beyond the fs over 2. So anyway, so from this point, we have a uh, one tone here and in 0 dB full scale. And then this is 0 dB. And then we, we have uh, nothing uh, except for your signal tone at 1,000. Uh, 8, 8, Okay, we get nothing, right? That's what we uh, see in the previous slide. And then we now are about to introduce the quantization process into this signal, okay? And from this signal, we, uh, we are going to um, introduce quantization noise, right? So, um, <clears throat> So, and then before and after quantization, right, the signal, your input signals should be the same, right? At a, a thousand, you still have a same signal. But now, your, let's say your analog signal should be the same with your data code, but with the quantization noise. Right, and then think think about uh, think about uh, this quantization process. So this is kind of half. Uh, this is um, it's, it's it's good to um, uh, good to good to see that uh, how this quantization process really um, really really doing to uh, your signal. Okay, so let that let's just. Uh, Okay, so you have a continuous time signal here, and then you sample like this. And this sampled signal will have a infinite precision, like that. So this once you take the DFT for this signal, you will get uh, this one. Okay, and then let's say you get this one. Okay, you, you don't have any kind of circuit noise and any kind of noise. It's a fewer signal. You, you sample with the infinite free region, right? You sample your signal and then throw that into the DFT. So you only have a signal being here. Okay, then you throw that into your um, <clears throat> ADC. So you basically introduce the quantization process. So in this quantization process, let's just, uh, let's just say um, this is 1.1 um, and the next threshold is 1.2. So <clears throat> in this case, this data output, okay, Let's say talk about this data output is below the middle of 1.1 and 1.2, which is the 1.15, right? This is a smaller than 1.15. Now your data output becomes 1.1. So, so your signal was originally 1.2 with uh, infinite free season. Is now you have a data output is only 1.1. Okay, and then the Last of this value, which is the 0.12 something, right? This is the quantization error. Okay, and then in the previous lecture note, uh, we assume that this quantization error is normally um, uncorrelated to your input signal. So then we can uh, consider this kind of error as a, a random noise, right? Just like a summon noise, it's a white white noise. Okay, so then we already calculate uh, from uh, from here. We already calculate the uh, bin magnitude of white noise, right? So in this case, in this case, we already knew. Um, the how much noise you get. The RMS, we already knew the RMS of this quantization noise, right? So, 
as you keep processing your sample the signal, you, you keep processing the quantization, you, you, you just do the quantization process, then every time you, you take care of one sample, you get uh, this quanti the sequence of these quantization errors. Like, uh, let's say, for the first sample, you have uh, this much quantization error, and for the second sample, you might get, uh, uh, let's say, so this much quantization error. So every time you 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 processing the input sample, you just keep adding this much quantization errors, right? And then, and then you, let's say we we now take care of the the let's say this is the quantization noise one, and this is quantization noise two, and and so on. So and we are going to take a, a ten thousand uh, samples, right? We now we have a Q1 and Q2 and until the Q9999. Right? So we already but we don't know we don't need to know the the each uh, quantization node each value the value of the each quantization noise, right? We already only thing we need to know is the RMS value of this quantization noise. Okay? And then we already knew that uh, the RMS value of quantization. The, the moment, the moment you uh, set the um, spec of your ADC, for example, like uh, uh, reference voltage of your ADC starting from zero to REF, and the resolution number of bit of your ADC, then this quantization noise, the RMS value of quantization noise is already fixed, right? So how much is that? It's a uh, delta over square root 12. And this delta is the reference divided by 2 to 5 n. So the moment you set the reference voltage and number of bit, you already knew the RMS value of your quantization noise. It doesn't really matter whether you sample 1,000 uh, or 10,000 and 100,000. It doesn't really matter. The RMS value of your quantization noise uh, is already fixed. Okay, so then go back to here that we know that uh, every time you uh, you do the quantization for your input, you we we add the, this kind of quantization noise here. Okay, and then we know that they should be the white and random, meaning that their frequency being all have until the last all should have the same height, right? And then we already calculate how much is this. Yeah, we already knew how much is this the height, so it, it, we, we did uh, many times, and for now, uh, you, you should know. Okay, so um, <clears throat> let's just do the calculation. So. Again, the, this is the RMS value of quantization noise, is this one, right? RMS of this value, okay? You take the, so this, in actual case, this is number, but you can have a plus or a minus, right? Between the half plus minus half RSB, you can, you can have any, any, uh, you can have any uh, quantization error, right? So this one, um, have a, either have a plus sign or minus negative, okay? So, um, to calculate this one, actually, you need to do, uh, take the absolute value of this one and take a square, right? And uh, like this. Okay, and then you take the mean value of this one and you take the square root of this one. So, you put uh, the, the, you don't need to calculate uh, by yourself, right, for this one, RMS value of your quantization. As long as your input is uncorrelated to your, uh, the, the quantization noise and your input uh, uncorrelated to each other, then you can, you can just use this one. That's, uh, just, that's just one simple assumption that uh, because of that assumption, you don't need to go to the lab and you just measure the, all the quantization noise and then 
um, the calculate the RMS value, right? So it's already there. So um, in this case, in our case, uh, reference was two four in eight to eight, and we are we will have a sixteen bit ADC. So divide by square root twelve, so it will give you twelve point five microvolt. Okay. So twenty four five microvolt. So starting from this one, we we know how much is the the magnitude of your um, the quantization noise frequency beam, right? It's uh, simply like this. So then it's minus one thirty seven below the first scale. Okay. Then go back to this one. Go back to this graph. Okay. So without the before we take the quantization, we only have uh, this uh, input signal at uh, 8,000, 8, right? Now we do this quantization process, we are supposed to get uh, this plot quantization frequency beams, frequency beams for the quantization noise, and then there um, they should be 137 dB below your input. So this difference should be minus uh, 137 dB. Okay, so even before we uh, take the take a look at the output of your DFT, we already knew that how your output will look like. Why? Because uh, the noise is only the quantization and there is no distortion, right? So mm. we can simply calculate like this. Again, uh, as I told you, the reason why we do the quantization is just, it's not just because we want to see the, how much quantization noise is there and how much is your input signal. They, they are already given. Okay? Once you spec the ADC and once you know uh, the amplitude of your input signal and frequency of your signal, and this is already given. So uh, we are not just taking the DFT to see that uh, this one. This one is already new. So we, well, the, the reason why we are taking the DFT is because uh, starting from uh, this uh, input sample, so we basically, um, until now, we do uh, some filtering, anti-aliasing filtering, your, your input signal is coming in. We do the MPN filtering and then we do some sampling and then we do some quantization. So all Throughout this all this process, we might add some unknown noise, and also we might add some unknown harmonics or distortion, and then the the reason why we are doing the quanti we are doing uh, the DFT is because uh, how much is this? We want to know uh, how much of this value. Your input and quantization noise is is already there. We we don't need to. Uh, we don't need to take the DFT to only see um, the input and quant the quantization noise. That, that's, uh, that's what we already knew. Okay, so then the, um, uh, once I sample the input, uh, throw the sample the input into this function, then uh, I'm, I'm supposed to get uh, this kind of uh, uh, DFT output. And let's, let's see what happened. Okay, this is the DFT output, okay? Of, uh, of this data, the out, okay, which is the output from the loud function. So if you just look at uh, this DFT, the thing is that the uh, input is okay. Right? Uh, at 10,000 bin, I get a uh, full scale input. It's okay. But the thing is that uh, somewhere here, I should have uh, flat quantization noise, right? Okay, so that's what we expected from a uh, previous slide here, right? But it's totally different. The difference is that um, we don't have a quantization, we don't get the quantization noise, but instead we now get the uh, huge tones at uh, 3000 frequency beam. Okay. When you um, when you talk about this this slide, that um, only thing we assume is that uh, the input and quantization noise are totally uncorrelated, right? That's that's the only thing. 
as, as long as we meet that assumption, right, then we should get uh, this output, okay, instead of this one. So, so that, mean that, that, that means that um, we basically now violate that assumption. That's why we get uh, this huge tone instead of a quantization noise, okay. So the quantization noise should be the white, as long as your input and the quantization are totally, totally uncorrelated to each other, right? Once you violate that kind of assumption, that assumption that you, instead of quantization noise, now you should get uh, this, to this kind of distortion, okay? Uh, this is the problem, why? Because uh, as I told you, the reason why we want to, we need to take the DFT it's because we want some noise and also some distortion from uh, the, the circuit. So maybe inside your low phase filter, if you are using just in, in, instead of a simple, um, simple uh, passable filter, if you have an active uh, second order filter, then inside this your low phase filter here, you might have some OPM. And that OPM will introduce the distortion, okay? So let's say in, in that case, you want to see the how much distortion can be introduced from your OPM, right? But if you have a huge tone at here, instead of a flat quantization noise, then you're basically, the distortion from that OPM might be placed in here, so the uh, harmonic you might get from the distortion. But this harmonic is already add it up with your uh, quantization noise, right? Then you can never see how much is the distortion. And then that's the problem. So thing is that uh, we need to get rid of this uh, quantization noise distortion and make them, uh, make them as a, like a white noise, okay? So then let's see how, what, what is this, this thing happens, okay? So, <clears throat> here just take, so by taking, I told you that uh, your analog input sample should be equal to your digital output plus the quantization noise. So to see the quantization noise in, into your, from uh, your MATLAB, right, the only thing you need to do is just you place the, you, you, you write the code, write of code like this. Your, Every time you have a sample and you have a digital output, and you, you subtract them from each other, then that will give you the quantization noise. So let's just take a look at the quantization noise for each sample like this, okay? And then you can see that this quantization noise uh, is not random. It's a periodic, right? Starting from, go back to, uh, starting from zero, you have uh, some numbers, then go back to zero, then you get the same number, right, so same quantization, meaning that your uh, quantization noise is not random, it's now, it's a, a periodic, okay, then this periodic quantization noise show up at, as a harmonic at your, um, your DFT plot. So we basically, then we need to do is just avoid the periodic quantization noise, right, it's, it's very easy. So the reason why we get this quantum, in, in the real circuit, even though your input, uh, your, in, the, in the real circuit, you basically have a, uh, you basically have a, the other kind of noise and everything. So it's, it's, it never be uh, periodic, okay? But uh, and, and at least in simulation, we don't have that kind of noise, right? So uh, now, because your input frequency and your F FS is your input is 300K and your FS is three megahertz. So that's why we get uh, the, your um, FS is an integer multiple of your input signal. So that's why we get this periodic quantization noise. So then in order to break that uh, periodicity, we can change the, we can slightly uh, change the input frequency, like for example, instead of 300K, and we can change the input frequency 300.1K, right? That way, 
this periodic the signal is just gone. Okay. And then the in in real in real field application, you don't need. need uh, we don't normally care whether you tested your, your circuit with 300k or 300.01k, the, the very a slight uh, difference, right, between two signals. So either you tested with your circuit with 300k and 301k, it doesn't really matter. But if you use this frequency, it, it, it is obvious that uh, you can uh, avoid this uh, periodic uh, quantization noise. Right. So then, uh, in our in in my metal code, I change the 300k to 301k, and then I take the DFD. So I'm supposed to get the tone input tone at here and some quantization noise at this one. But now I get uh, I get sh huge distortion or. Uh, uh, all sp spread all through the frequency beams, right? And the input is still there, but uh, uh, I, I get a huge discussion. It's because uh, this is uh, because uh, uh, your energy of your input signal is uh, basically spread into other beams. If you're you are not really careful about your uh, DFT uh, equations, DF DFT. Uh, properties okay so let's just take a look at why we get uh, this kind of a situation so um, when we do the DFT so you know the once we sample the continuous time signal just everything is just keep repeating right every multiple of F onto until the infinite uh, infinite uh, uh, number of FS right so that uh, DFT is basically uh, assumes when whenever we take the DFT the DFT occasion uh, assumes that uh, everything is just keep repeating. Okay, so um, meaning that um, okay, so once we let's say once once we ten take the uh, take the n n uh, n point DFT right, so DFT assumes that everything just keep repeating. With the endpoint window. Okay, so this is one window, and then TFT assumes that second window is just keep repeating like this. Okay, this is the basic, uh, basic property under the TFT. But here, Okay, so when first first when we sample when of apply the three hundred k with the uh, um, and ten thousand and fs is uh, three megahertz, right? So basically, within one DFT window starting from zero to n minus one, we exactly the integer multiples of a sinusoidal signal into in this DFT. So. Next, starting from n to uh, two n minus one, this same signal is just uh, keep repeating, okay, and continuously. So this, the end, the end of the signal at the first DFT zone, and then this is second DFT zone, and beginning of the second DFT zone is just matched where here. And then just they are just keep repeating. It's like they are just one just continuous signal. Okay, so this was okay with uh, this setting. But now we slightly change the input frequency, right? A little bit, right? So the the if you just take take the the edge of this the 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 FFT window. Right, you, we we basically zoom in here. We slightly change the input frequency. Now input frequency is starting from this point. At the end, your input frequency is just end at and at this point. Okay, starting from here and end at this point. So then, 
we take the sample, right? So we take the 10,000 samples like this way. But then DFT assumes that the uh, next one is just keep repeating. So next sample, again, starting from here. And then it goes like this. Okay. And the last one, again, starting and end like this. So then if you take a look at this portion, right, there is a huge discontinuity. Okay. From from the first um, DFT window to the second DFT window, this edge of the DFT window, we get the huge, um, huge uh, the discontinuity here. That because of this continuity, your signal spectrum is just spread into all frequency bands. That's, that's, so here, still here, we have a quantization noise. Okay. Because now the quantization noise is random. We just break the pre elasticity of your quantization error. So we get this one. But uh, the reason why we don't see that uh, quantization noise is because your signal energy is, is now spread uh, uh, the all frequency beams and your quantization noise is buried under that, uh, uh, the, 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 the signal. Okay, so that, that is spread the signals, that's why. So it's quantization is okay now. But uh, then why this signal uh, spreading effect is happens? Because, uh, because of this discontinuity. So then how we can uh, remove this continuity? Um, we need to put the, meaning that we need to put the just integer multiple input, right? integer multiple input, input cycle, input period, right, into, uh, uh, in, in within this one uh, pre DFT, uh, DFT uh, window, right? How we do that? Um, instead of uh, like a 300, 101K, we need to put, uh, we, need to, we need to keep this uh, input frequency is just the integer. Integer multiple of your, um, you are basically, uh, no, no, the, 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 other, the other way around. We need to put uh, your FS, it should be the integer multiple of your input frequency. Okay? So either, either way, fine. If, if your FS is uh, fixed, then your input, you need to uh, be very, very careful of choosing your input frequency such that. Uh, Within the one within this DFT window, you you should get the integer multiple of uh, input period. Okay, okay. So then the, anyway. So um, in in summary, we we try to avoid the uh, periodic quantization error. So we change the input frequency. But now uh, because of some problem in in your input frequency, now we get the uh, um, uh, the the spe this is called the spectral leakage. Okay, we call that uh, we we get uh, this spectral leakage. So then, how we can avoid the uh, uh, avoid the spectral leakage at the same time avoid the the quantization noise, uh, periodic quantization noise is one. There there are two different ways. So one way is just the windowing using the windowing. So win windowing is like uh, just that that's another time sample that looks like this one. So, so starting from, uh, let's say this, uh, this is just a series of numbers starting from W0, W1 and so on. So this one is a W0, which is zero and W1 is a little bit, a little bit taller and W2 and so on. It just looks like, uh, this is just a 10,000 number of time sample, okay? But this time sample just looks like this. We call that the uh, window. And this is, the, there are another, um, the, just the, so the window is just um, just number of time sample with a spe special shape. You can, you can think of that like this. So this kind of a window we call hand window. There, there, are, there are many different types of windows like a 
having window, uh, blank one Harris window, and then many different types of window. You can you can use any 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 of them. Normally, uh, that doesn't really matter uh, for uh, the to uh, measure the dynamic performance of the ADC. But anyway, so it looks like this, and then once you take the take the DFT for this window and just uh, look at the, this one, it's, it looks like this. So um, it has uh, almost like a zero, a one gain of one at at DC, and then just like a low phase filter, the output looks like this. So uh, what we are going to do is that. Um, we know that uh, this discontinuity happens uh, at the edge of the DFT window. So, um, let's say you have an input sample, All right? So this sample is now taken with uh, three megahertz input, and with your input frequency is instead of a 300k. Now we change it to 301k, right? Because of uh, the periodic quantization noise, and then we know that with this setting we get uh, this discontinuity, and with uh, this continuity we get a spectral leakage. So what we are going to do is that uh, now you have uh, this time sample, and then you multiply this time sample with uh, window time samples. Okay. Then what happened here is that uh, at the end, edge of this DFT window, this value is almost zero, right? Meaning that the last one go to back to the zero. Okay. So we know that uh, this continue happens at the ed at the edge. So edge value we initially we we basically um, intentionally the Reduce the uh, the amplitude magnitude of edge sample. And now, because this is reduced, some of the this energy should be go into some meter, something like that. So that's the idea how this works. So that way we can reduce or minimize the this continuity at, at the edge. So then we take the DFT of this value instead of. Uh, original sample, now we, we uh, multiply the window uh, sample to sample uh, with the window sample to sample and then we take the DFT and it, it looks like this. Okay, so we can still keep the uh, keep the keep this uh, input frequency but now you we, we remove the spectral leakage, right? And then you you because the your spectral leakage is gone, we start to see that uh, quantization noise. So which is the flat random quantization noise, right? Because of this frequency, and then window. We initially we have uh, this kind of spectral leakage, but now window can remove this one. But instead, you see that. Uh, you, anyway, so your your input frequency your your input should was supposed to place that at ten thousand, but now this one your input signal is spread into nine nine nine, eight ten thousand, and eight one oh one thousand. You your input is spread into uh, three frequency bins, but that's okay. So whenever you calculate the uh, whenever you calculate the uh, input power, right? Instead of just uh, calculate this one, you can add them up together in the power domain, right? Uh, so it's okay. There's still, uh, your input frequency is spread uh, into into two adjacent uh, neighbors, but it's okay. Okay, this is one way uh, you can avoid the spectral leakage, but uh, but this no, that this this. Um, there is another very simple way to avoid the spectral leakage instead of using a window. Okay, so the other way is just using the coherent sample, something called the coherent sampling. Okay, so meaning that we can we can steer well within the within the the DF2 window, we can still put the integer multiples of uh, input 
uh, period into one uh, the DFT window, right? Without having a periodic quantization knowledge. That's what the coherent sampling means. So once you know that uh, your input, location of your input is the DFT resolution multiplied by dm. So initially we have uh, 300k and fs was 3 megahertz. So n was 10,000. So meaning that we have a uh, thousand m was thousand and then in this case we don't have a spectral leakage but we have a periodic quantization knowledge so in order to both uh, meet the both uh, uh, the the in order to remove the quantize both the quantization knowledge and also spectral leakage let's say now change this one change it to some prime number but which is very close to a thousand still but uh, it's a prime number like uh, one or three 1003 okay so that means that you still have your you this signal is still very close to 300k right but even though you want to know your circuit response at 300k input but 300.9k input doesn't really matter it's very close to uh very close to 300k Right, so in the in kind in the field application, either you tested your circuit with a 300k or 300.9k, it still doesn't really matter. So it's okay. So this small shift in the input frequency doesn't really matter in real application. So, but then, because you put the prime number, you know that you you should learn by yourself. Okay, you can first you can uh, break that periodic quantization noise. Now you don't have a quantization noise in period. And also you don't have a spectral leakage. Why? Because, uh, because uh, within one DFT window, right? When this is M is 100, that means you have a 100 period within this DFT window. But now you have a hundred uh, a thousand period, right? Now you have a, and then we change it to input frequency to 1 or K, right? This means that uh, within this time window, your, um, the number of period is a little bit below that, uh, below this uh, 10,000, might be 99 point something, but not integer. That's why we get the spectral leakage and discontinuity and spectral leakage. But now, if we have a uh, thousand three, meaning that you still get the uh, integer number of uh, period in here, so it's one hundred one or three thousand three, right? So in this case, you don't get the uh, spectral leakage and you don't get this continuity, right? Still okay. So by choosing your input frequency a little bit cleverly, right? You can you can avoid both uh, periodic quantization noise and spectral leakage. So uh, that we call the Korean sampling. So we normally when we um, when we run the simulation with your MATLAB, we basically use the Korean sampling. Okay. So. Um, so then when. Then why why we are using a window? Is is there, there are sometimes then this this is a simulation, so you can you can choose whatever the frequency you want, right? But sometimes in real application, the input frequency is just a fixed. You don't you don't really change the you cannot really change the input frequency. But in that case, uh, you you need to use the window. Okay, but uh, anyway, so we, we are going, in this class, we are going to run the simulation with the MATLAB. So you can, you can just use the Korean sampling. So, okay, so with, uh, with just change, I, I, I didn't do anything except for the shift to your input frequency from uh, 300K to 300.9K. And then run the DFT, so finally uh, we get the output, what we, just like what we expected, right? We have a, a thousand, we have an input, full scale input, and then your quantization noise 
it's almost flat and and then it's the 137 dB below your input right it's okay so um, the conclusion is that uh, if you don't know uh, you you don't want to know um, exactly what is really happening beyond the uh, this DFT plot just use the coin sampling okay um, okay so uh, let's just finish up the, this um, uh, this lecture so um, okay so now we 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 know how to run the simulation of the um, idea uh, at the ADC right and then the next step is just let's just use the, let's just add some uh, real world problem. Let's just add some modeling for the real world problem. Just uh, this is just one case. Into your you start first start with the uh, ideal code, and then you just add up uh, one uh, errors one by one, and uh, in, in, into your code. So your code is becomes more like a well, more like a real. Okay. So this is one example. Let's say um, let's say your your input signal is coming in. in in the real world, real chip. Your input signal should be connected with the metal line. Okay, your input signal is going into this direction with the metal line. Okay, and then let's say let's say this is your ADC. So inside the ADC, you again we. Talk about that ADC requires some reference. And then this reference voltage should be generated somewhere and then supplied to your um, supplied to your ADC like this. Okay? So this reference voltage will be anyways placed near your ADC and then connected through the same as your input, connected through the metal line. Okay two metal line in between we might get some uh, silicon dioxide like a uh, dielectric material so this is just capacitor okay meaning that you might get parallel capacitor in between so reference voltage should be let's say if your ADC in, in our case is like a point uh, minus uh, that's also that uh, the DC. The reference voltage should be the DC. It doesn't. It should not change, right? It should not change with time. So let's say if your reference is one volt, this should be stay the same at one volt, right? That's the, what the reference voltage does. So, but then with this uh, physical layout, now you get the uh, uh, parallel capacitance in between your input and reference. So whenever you, but your input is just keep changing. So whenever your input is changing, this reference voltage will be that there is a substrate. Okay, you, and also your substrate is connected somewhere. So between your reference to substrate or the some other circuit, this one still have a C. So see that there there are a C and C capacity division of this, your ADC, meaning that. Your reference might have some, even though it's a small, but still affected by your input. Okay, so let's say uh, this C and this C have a maybe a, about ten thousand ratio, meaning that your reference voltage is no longer uh, DC. Your reference voltage now start having some small part of your input, right? Like this. So initial code was. Uh, like a, was like a, uh, here, right? Here, initial code was like we assume that we reference DC, but now you have a small, small input, small piece of input added to reference because of this kind of error. So this kind of thing cannot be. Uh, have happening all the time. So, if you knew the 
this reference voltage is affected by your input, then maybe in the layer phase you can move this somewhere uh, far from your input. But let's say, let's assume that you made mistake like uh, putting your reference metal line with uh, very close to your input, and then you might get this kind of uh, small ripple on your reference voltage, and then let's see what happened to your output. See, you start to see this uh, huge second order harmonic because of this. Even though this is very, very small, in, in time sample or in time domain, you don't really see uh, this ripple because this is very small, but uh, once you take the, once you take the DFT and take a look at the uh, spectrum, you start to seeing that this harmonic. So this is definitely not good. So meaning that uh, you need to you need to modify your layout such that you don't get uh, you don't get this kind of uh, harmonics right there. Okay, so this is just one example um, in the real circuit. There there are a lot of things can go wrong, and you need to you need to model very carefully. You need to modify your metal code very carefully with all these kind of errors. Okay, so um, the, for the dynamic performance, we normally have uh, three things to define the dynamic performance. The signal uh, to noise ratio, this is only the signal power and noise beam, uh, the noise power. And signal to noise and distortion ratio, you add a uh, distortion beam, like, uh, such like this one, right? That beam power is added to the signal power that we call the SNDR. This is the most important, okay? And also, uh, harmonic distortion, total harmonic distortion. Sometimes uh, people want to see that uh, uh, only the if you have a lot of harmonics, people want to see that how much is the harmonic power. Uh, that's the THD, and something like that. Okay, so um, if you have any question regarding uh, this lecture note, you can uh, you can email me anytime, or you can uh, you can ask uh, 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 you, you can uh, you can. Ask me a question um, in the next um, Monday class. Okay, so that's it.